going to hear from our last speaker of this panel, which will be Dr. K. Feeling Husbands. Dr. H Feeling's Husbands is an economist and a dean at uh, Georgia State University. Kay, take it away. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am really, as everyone else has said, honored to be here. Um, amazing um, workshop from beginning to, you know, my, my panel members here. I am just learning so much and writing down so many notes that I need to follow up on. So hopefully um, I can quickly enough address the questions that I was asked to address. Um, one was about leadership and how I got into leadership in the first place and also what's going on at Georgia Tech um, along those lines. So I am not driving my slides, so you hear me say periodically, next slide please, but um, I just want you to know that I'm, I'm just thrilled to be able to be with you and answer your questions afterwards. As you can see from the subtext here, it says inclusive leadership in the room where it happens. That's what was in our notes when we received our instructions. And I added there and at the table because it's so important not only to be in a room, but at the table where decisions are being made. Um, next slide, please. What, what is interesting here is that um, with our uh, CIOS committee, and we've heard others refer to the Committee on Equal Opportunities in Science and Engineering at the National Science Foundation, um, a series of reports have come out, but this latest report really does focus on bold leadership actions. Um, there are small numbers of underrepresented groups and underserved communities within STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it's so important that we see a way forward to really increase representation across all of these groups and this recent report points to NSF's um, need to demonstrate and promote bold leadership actions, not just within the agency, but also bold leadership actions across the board. And you've heard from business, um, you've heard from creative uh, uh, folks in music and, and the arts, you've heard from um, other colleagues here who are in academic, at academic institutions, uh, and I'm sure that you've also heard from government leaders as well of what does it take to truly um, have a you know, broader participation in STEM fields. And one of the things we discovered as we were going through and writing this report um, that really resonated across the board is that broadening participation is not a problem, but a strategy to promote and advance scientific research, learning and innovation. And I'll come back to that toward the end. Next slide, please. So I just can't help myself. I'm an economist by training, so I have to put some numbers on the board. But this is a lot to look at. And um, this is actually a, a slide that was developed by our colleagues in CIOS, or the staff of CIOS, and in collaboration with Jose Fuentes, who is, is the chair of, of CIOS. Um, and what I want you to look at here, you know, as an African-American woman, a Black woman, if you look at the right-hand side, you see that you know, the population in 2019 was about 6.7% of the population. If you look at the left-hand side, you see that science and engineering occupations, Black women, 1.8% of the population. And you can go on down and see this under-representation or disproportionately low representation in science and engineering compared to the population for many different groups. Next slide, please. The other thing I want you to see, and I'm just gonna go through a few more of these, and this picture says a lot. Look in the middle where you see the zero. To the right, you see thousands of a number of women, and to the left, you see percentage of women. Now, these are degrees awarded to women in economics in 1998, in 2008, and in 2018, toward the bottom. And you can see that while these numbers are increasing, the shares are not increasing uniformly. And you can also see how small the numbers are. Next slide, please. So we're you know, not really visible. In terms of representation, again, these lines here, this one is science and engineering degrees earned by underrepresented minorities between 2008 and 2018. And again, really low shares, um, not just underrepresented, but low shares, low numbers. 
And we really don't just want to be visible, but we also need to be present. And that's what I hope also that the work that I've been doing and work we're doing in this workshop and, and, and brought more broadly, I'm really hoping that that's where we can get to. Next slide, please. Just a couple more of these. Um, now, this is something that has caught the attention of many leaders, of course. Janet Yellen in 2019 and before that in 2014 convened a number of African-American and mostly women to talk about underrepresentation in the, the area of economics. Um, and on the right side, you see reference to an article by Dr. Hannah Valentine and Dr. Francis Collin, both at the National Institutes of Health. Interestingly, if you look at what they were looking at in this PNAS article and, and really asking us to, to dig more deeply, what are the effective and sustainable interventions that work and what do we need to know to get there? So the first bullet says, we really need more information and better research on the impact of diversity on quality, the quality and outputs within STEM. Secondly, not only do we need the research, but we need evidence-based approach, approaches to training and persistence in STEM, not just get people in to STEM fields, but also make sure that there's a persistence that you don't see a, a, a drop off after the second year of college or a drop off not going on to other um, areas of higher education. Third bullet says, but wait a minute, what are some factors that really are barriers to diversity? And we need to understand what those are. Um, some are psychological, some are social, some are actually economic. And let's identify what those barriers are. We need that much more information. And the last bullet here says that we have to have a scalable strategy to disseminate and sustain diversity. With that, I would also add that it's very necessary to have true leadership in this area. Otherwise, we're not going to move the needle forward in any of these categories. Um, next slide, please. So here is what I was asked, um, you know, one of my questions. What was your path to leadership, including barriers, um, barriers, people, and circumstances that were beneficial? And I had to really think this one through and determine, you know, what did I want to say in a very short space of time? So when I was coming through, even in high school, love math. Math was my thing, made sense in my head. Um, as an undergraduate, I was a double major in math and economics. Again, made sense in my head. Those are the things that I thought um, that I, I really um, made sense um, and I could do well at, I could succeed. Next slide, please. Now that is coming from where I, you know, what the slide that you see here, that's the house, the, the second house I lived in when I was growing up in Barbados. I'm from Barbados originally. Um, emigrated to the U.S. when I was seven and a half, almost eight. Here I'm about five years old. This is probably a first day of school for kindergarten or something like that. Um, at that time, I had no idea that the data that I just showed you about underrepresentation existed, of course. I didn't have a sense that someone that looked like me would not or should not or could not do math or economics, it wasn't in my, in, my, in my frame of mind. And thank goodness that that was not part of um, my, my growing up. But let me just put another few data out here, again, from NSF data. In 2018, um, the number of PhDs that graduated with a PhD in, in economics, so the number of PhDs minted in 2018 in economics, 1,326. How many of those were female? 427. How many were of the 1,326 were African American? 21. And if you go back 20 years, you'll also see consistently between 15 and 20, 15 and 21 or so minted. I earned um, a PhD in 1990 and in economics. And again, not really focused on the fact that these shares and these numbers were so few um, and that if I were in the room going forward that I would be the only one in the room oftentimes. I'd like you to focus on the slide just for one more minute because 
this quote on the right side really resonated with me when I read it in Harvard Business Review. Small numbers cannot be a rationale to stall progress. Limited data renders underrepresented groups more invisible and creates a roadblock to meaningful change. It's so important, not just that these numbers increase and representation increase, it is critically important that we understand the foundations, the, the data, the information that's necessary to be able to say, what is the state of affairs? What do we need to do to change things? What are those barriers? And how do we just get the, the, the wherewithal and the leadership that's necessary to move the needle? Um, and it's so important also for outcomes, for outputs, for innovation and so on. So that's another point that I just continue wanted to come back to. But, you know, coming from this time that you see here, next slide, please. Um, I ended up um, not only changing my, not my field, I'm still an economist, but focusing more on science and technology policy and then transitioning to looking at well, what are those differentials um, in earnings and in employment, black, white? What are the differentials in earnings for uh, women versus men in scientific fields and in, at science agencies? Um, what are the pathways um, versus pathways to broadening participation, not just focusing and relying on the pipeline metaphor, but thinking about pathways. What does that look like? And we can talk about that in the, in the um, Q&A, and I can explain that a little bit more. Um, that's a bit of the research that I transitioned to looking at because I was very curious about getting that evidentiary basis for broadening participation in STEM because it's so important. In the process of going from an economist to policy, to leading a school of public policy, and now as Dean of Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts, um, the humanities and social sciences are in my college, very excited about that, <laughs> what yo, -Yo Ma was describing. Um, I was also asked to, if I wanted to go to an executive leadership program um, to you know, hone skills in leadership, not something I ever thought I would do, but again, having mentors and, and um, others who were willing in the background sometimes just to put things before me that I could utilize, champions, advocates, mentors, sponsors, those, that was actually very helpful. In that program, we were asked to dig deeply, and it was a nine-month program, and think about what drives us, what is so essential to us, not just in our work, but in our home and in our family. We, we had to look at both together. I, I wanted to put that on the table and bring that back. Um, and after thinking about it over time and consulting with others in my small group within the ELI program, the, term, the, the phrase that came to my mind was this, be the person whom others can rely on to advise, guide, and confide in as they make their way to their own excellence. That's my go-to statement. That's my go statement in terms of leadership. That's the kind of leader I'd like to be. Someone not only leading to accomplish the things that are within my own sphere, but really more so and, and, and importantly for others to make their way to their own excellence. So that is where we, and that is one thing I learned in that leadership program um, that I kind of developed um, for myself. Um, the next slide, please. Another aspect of leadership, uh, we were, at, I was asked to give a talk at the end of the program and um, had to really dig again a little deeply to think about what does leadership really mean to me? What are my leadership principles? So these are mine. These are not the things that you, you find somewhere. These are things that came about because I was in conversation with my small group and learning quite a bit from others. Passion, caring about others and the things that they do. Knowledge, you've heard me say, evidence and communication of that knowledge, really important. Courage, I'm a, an introvert, kind of quiet, um, and I kept being prodded by my colleagues, speak up, advocate internally and externally, have something, have something to say, say it, lead. Um, listen with intention, patience, mentoring and support of others. 
Collaboration is key, um, interdisciplinary systems view. And after today, I added center and fringe <laughs> boundaries. So important to have that kind of collaboration. Um, next one was transparency. Be fair and equitable in, our, in my processes and the things that I do as a leader. And of course, principles first, ethical decision-making and not equivocating on that at all. So those are the things that I wanted to actually punctuate this discussion with, not only in terms of how to get and develop into a, the leader that I am now, not something I set out to be, but also introspection and in trying to determine what do I wanna drive home? What, what really matters? And how do I wanna operate? And those are the things that I wanted to develop here. Last few slides, I was also asked the question, you know, what is going on at Georgia Tech? And here, next slide, please, I decided to focus on leadership development. There are a lot of other things going on. Um, there's constellations for coders, for, for, for you know, elementary school students to work on things. Um, there's Project Engages, something that um, students that are in junior and senior year of high school can come to the lab in the afternoon um, at Georgia Tech and learn you know, hands-on what science and engineering is and biomedical engineering specifically. Many other programs, but what I wanted to zero in on here are our leadership programs. I asked Terry Bloom this question last night. She delivered four or five paragraphs full of information about leadership programs here. I just wanted to stress a few of those. Next slide, please. And as on the right side, you see the University System of Georgia Executive Leadership Program it, or Executive Leadership Institute. And that's what I mentioned to you before that I went through and it was just fantastic. Um, I, I, and it, it, it just really helped not only to give us tools but helped us to look inward to determine what kind of leader we want to be. Um, on the left side, you'll see that there are Provost Emerging Leaders Program um, and a Shadow Program. Those are programs that my faculty um, participate in. Um, you'll see also HERS, um, Higher Education Leadership Programs for Women, Leadership Atlanta, Leadership Georgia. Again, many of my faculty do participate in these programs year after year. And on the right side, again, you'll see that I have faculty and staff, not only faculty and staff um, that participate in the ELI program, Executive Leadership Institute, but also Inclusive Leaders Academy. It's so important for us within academia to ensure that we have professional development, not only for our students, of course, and for our faculty, but also for our staff. And those are some of the programs that I just wanted to put on the table that we are engaging in at Georgia Tech. Next slide, please. Just to wrap up, um, I wanted to put this here. <laughs> I was talking about diversity, equity, inclusion. Someone said that's the term these days, or JEDI, justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, I was actually talking to someone in our foundation, um, on the foundation side of Georgia Tech. And we were talking about diversity and how important it is. And this person said, we cannot have robust innovation without incorporating principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It, it was just so part of this person's understanding of what was necessary for success that DEI was very much part of that. Another thing that we talk about quite a bit is looking at our budget model and within our budget model, what can we say um, that we can do to ensure that we broaden participation and that's across the board, all types of underserved groups. What can we do? We need to be seeing the breakthrough. We need to be seeking the breakthrough. And a good part of that is within our reach, but we have to have the leadership to do so. Next slide, please. So I just wanna thank you very much for listening to my, my you know, different pathways that I was able to take, nothing that I thought was coming, but it sure did evolve. In the background and sometimes in the foreground, many mentors and champions and guides um, along the way. And I still think and feel that we can show in many ways how important it is to have this for the betterment of our science. It's not just about us, it's about all of us. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.